The next talk is on auto FHE, and Weo is going to give the talk. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Wei Ao. I'm a PhD student at Michigan State University. Today, I want to present our work, Auto FHE. First, I want to briefly introduce secure deep learning under fully homomorphic encryption. So we know now the customers, they can request the deep learning servers from the cloud. They just need to send out the encrypted data. And the cloud, after they receive the encrypted data, first they need to decrypt the encrypted data and uh, get the plain text data, and then use the uh, deep, deep neural networks to process the data and then get the prediction result encrypt, uh, encrypted and send back to the customer. So the problem is that both uh, data and the uh, prediction result, they are exposed to the cloud servers. So the, the customers, they take the risk to leak their uh, sensitive data. We know the fully homomorphic encryption can provide an end-to-end -end secure deep learning servers to the customers. So during this, uh, if we use fully homomorphic encryption, the, the cloud server, they don't need to decrypt the, the data. So both the data and the prediction result, they are not exposed to the cloud. So it can protect the customer's sensitive data, uh, their data security very well. This is a uh, history of the secure computation to the secure deep learning. In our work, we use the CKKS framework because CKKS can encrypt the uh, real numbers and the, um, and the complex numbers. It's a great fit for the neural networks. And uh, recently, MPCN uh, successfully demonstrated the deep convolutional neural networks under uh, CKKS FHE scheme. So we propose AutoFHE. AutoFHE can automatically uh, transfer, transform any convolutional neural networks so that we can evaluate the convolutional neural networks under uh, FH, uh, CKKS FHE. First, what is convolutional neural network? Convolutional neural networks, it has uh, convolutional layer, batch norm layer, and uh, ReLU layer. So repeat these layers. So this is a block of uh, residue uh, convolutional neural network. We repeat these blocks um, many times, and then we have the average pooling and the uh, free collecting layer. Then we get, it, uh, we get the prediction. If we want to evaluate these convolutional neural architectures, under homomorphic encryption, we need to tweak the architecture a little bit so that we can evaluate it under uh, CKKS. So now we input the encrypted data. Uh, it's a ciphertext, and uh, we will get an encrypted result. The prediction is an encrypted result. And uh, the, the, uh, ho the neural architecture and the weights of architecture, they are plain text and uh, hold by the uh, uh, cloud server. We know the CKKS only supports the multiplication, addition, and uh, rotation. And uh, the ReLU nonlinear activation functions uh, is maximal. So we need to replace the uh, ReLU activation functions by the polynomials. And uh, if we go in the convolutional neural network if the, uh, is going deeply, so we need the uh, we should consider the level. Level means the level of uh, level means the number of multiplications allowed to evaluate, and we assume the input ciphertext level is capital R. After we go through these layers, at some point we we are running out of all levels, and the level will be zero. So we need a corporate strapping to refresh the ciphertext to higher level, and the re after we ref refresh it, the level will be capital one minus capital K, and then we can continue our evaluation. Uh, for remaining la uh, layers. We know the bootstrapping, the latency is very high and uh, the memory footprint is also very high. So when we evaluate a deep, neuro deep convolutional neural network under CKKS, uh, the bootstrapping dominates the uh, total latency and the bootstrapping is, uh, is uh, a bottleneck of computation. When we design a deep convolutional neural network under free homomorphic encryption, we should consider secure requirements and uh, inferential latency and the prediction accuracy. So the first two, secu uh, the first two requirements, secure, security and the inferential, inference latency, they are majorly determined by the cryptographic parameters, like uh, psychonotomic degree, capital N, level, modulus, uh, bootstrapping depth, and uh, Hemingway. 
And the latency and the prediction accuracy, they are majorly de determined by the architecture of our convolutional neural networks, which uh, consider the implementation and, uh, uh, of convolutional layer, batch norm layer, pointing layer, which uh, consider their backing, uh, uh, packing and uh, the depths of different layers. We should uh, consider how to design polynomials. We consider the degree. Uh, the degree uh, determines the pre uh, approximation uh, precision of ReLU, and it also determines the depths of the polynomials. And uh, it, we should consider the number of layers, Im, uh, input image resolution, and the channel and the colors. So this design procedure is interactive between the CKKS parameters and the polynomial CNS. It's interactive to each other. For example, the cyclotomic polynomial degree, the capital N, will determine how many Slots we have how many numbers we can put into a, a single ciphertext. So it will determine the num cellos, colors, and the uh, input image resolutions. So if we, uh, to simplify this uh, qu question, if we given the uh, CKKS parameters, we consider how to des uh, design polynomials uh, so that we can plug in the polynomials into the CN structures, and we can evaluate the convolutional neural networks. An example is that uh, MPCN, MPCN, uh, the structure is that we uh, the input ciphertext level is equal to two, and we do convolution batch norm, and uh, the level equal to zero, and then we call bootstrapping to refresh the zero level ciphertext, and then uh, it use a high degree polynomial to replace the uh, real so this architecture is a fixed architecture, architecture. So they first design a high degree polynomial approximation of ReLU, and then plug in the high degree polynomial into the convolutional neural architecture. And then they just need to re replace uh, these architectures uh, many times, can build the whole architecture of polynomial convolutions. And uh, so we say they, need, they have to periodically call the bootstrapping, and the number of bootstrapping is very high, is as same as the number of convolutional layers. So the problem is that is that because you use a lot of bootstrapping, so we can estimate the latency is very high and the mem memory is also very high. Okay, so this is an example to use manually designed high degree polynomial to replace ReLU. And uh, simply we can also use no degree polynomial to replace ReLU and get uh, architecture. So intuitively, there is a lot of polynomial architectures between the high degree and the low degree poly uh, polynomials. How can we, how can we ob obtain all possible polynomial neural architectures? Our solution is that we don't, to, we don't, we don't have to optimize and uh, manually design different uh, polynomial functions to replace uh, nonlinear activation functions. We, we directly optimize end-to-end -end polynomial neural architectures. So this is a, a architecture. Uh, the previous work is this one. They use uh, one, sing one single polynomial to replace all ReLU. So now we change them to layer-wise polynomials. Layer-wise polynomials means that the different layers, they have different uh, sensitivity to the approximation uh, precision. So we can use a different degree of polynomials to replace different uh, ReLU. And uh, now the Bootstrapping the locations is also optional. We can put the bootstrapping at anywhere we want. So in that case, we can imagine there is a trade-off between the accuracy and the number of bootstrapping. And uh, we have different solutions over the trade-off between uh, number of bootstrapping and uh, accuracy. Because uh, bootstra bootstrapping dominates the uh, latency, so when we deploy these solutions, we will get the trade-off between the accuracy and the latency. And uh, this different solutions, actually they can meet different requirements in real world implementation. So sometimes the customers say, I want faster response. Uh, so we can give them a, 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 faster, a faster solution, like the solution one, but a, a little bit lower accuracy. Sometimes they say, I can, I, I can wait for an accurate result. So they can, we can give them more accurate result, but it also depends on the customer's uh, computational budget. If they have a high computational budget, uh, they can run. Uh, they can use more computational resource. So can they can use more uh, computational expensive solution. So 
our uh, so auto F3 is on the cloud servers side, so it's also in the context of deep learning as a service. Auto F3 takes a, a, low, a standard neural network as, as input, and then we automatically generate different polynomial uh, networks. These polynomial networks, they are uniformly distributed over a trade-off between the accuracy and the latency. This trade-off, uh, because it's optimal, we call it Pareto trade-off. And uh, the cloud servers, they save the, these different uh, uh, solutions on the cloud servers, and then uh, they can based the request from customers to provide different servers to the customer. Here we defined a general framework of, diff uh, of uh, polynomial, uh, polynomial functions for ReLU. We call it uh, evil ReLU. It can be very low degree. Uh, if the degree equal to one is pruning, just remove the ReLU function and also the square, square, square function. And we also include the high degree approximation of, of ReLU. For the high degree composite polynomial function, we propose to use a differentiable search. We search, we, we search their coefficients to, to, op, uh, to approximate the ReLU function. So because we also need to, uh, tra tra to train the polynomial architecture, uh, if we just simply replace uh, ReLU with zero ReLU, we can, we can imagine there is, uh, there are, there is some the accuracy drop. To recover the accuracy, we use backpropagation training. So we need the gradient. So for no degree, we just use the degrade the gradient. For the high degree, we don't take a gradient. Uh, we don't take a gradient over the high degree polynomials. We take gradient over the previous uh, ReLU function. So this is a STE estimated gradient. Because if we, uh, because we, if we use high degree approximation and the training it uh, and the train the networks, uh, the numerical state is not stable. Uh, if we use this polynomial aware training um, algorithm, we can make the training more stable. So now we know there is a trade-off be uh, between the accuracy and the latency. Now, how to get the different polynomial architectures? Our solution is that we use multi-objective evolutionary optimization algorithm. So now the different uh, uh, nearest uh, ReLU function are replaced by the evil ReLU, and then we should search for the location of bootstrapping. So this is a joint search problem between the layer-wise evil ReLU and the bootstrapping operations. And then we formulate it as a multi-objective optimization problem. So in that case, the architecture is very flexible, and uh, the bootstrapping is also on demand. We can reduce the number of bootstrapping, because bootstrapping the computation is very high. Uh, if we reduce the number of the bootstrapping, we can directly reduce, uh, we can directly accelerate the inference. So why, why do we use multi-objective optimization? So we know the existing works, uh, most of them, they use uh, single objective optimization. Uh, some works they consider, they also take into account the latency, but they combine two, uh, two objectives, accuracy and latency to a single objective and optimize a single objective. So the problem is that if you use a single objective optimization, I, uh, for one time optimization, you can only get a single solution. And uh, you need to tune the balance weights, alpha and the beta. Yeah, you, this, you need to do the experiments to get a good uh, setup for alpha and beta. And uh, because this objective function, they are a lot of convex, so this uh, object objective ob optimization result is not Pareto optimal. We use multi-objective optimization. We directly minimize the prediction error and the number of uh, bootstrapping. So we can get multiple solutions. The, these solutions, they are uniformly distributed on the Pareto front. And uh, we don't need to tune different uh, weights. The trade-off is uh, Pareto optimal. Uh, intuitively, maybe we can directly uh, minimize the types of polynomial, polynomial functions. But the problem is that it may not necessarily reduce the number of bootstrapping. For example, if the input ceftex level equal to four, and uh, if the lex polynomial, the depth is nine. In that case, you have to do the, you have to switch the modulus. And uh, in that case, you simply wasted uh, four levels. 
and then you don't need you, you don't reduce number of bootstrapping. So we do need to directly mini, uh, minimize the number of bootstrapping, so it can directly uh, accelerate the inference. The evolutionary multi-objective optimization. This is a general framework. So evolutionary multi-objective optimization is a population-based uh, optimization algorithm. So it has a type of uh, different uh, uh, candidate, 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 candidate solutions. So each solution, X1, uh, it has layer-wise evil ReLU, and uh, we have uh, many, many uh, candidate solutions. We just need to optimize these this candidate solutions to let them to uniformly distribute over a trade-off. We design the crossover and the mutation search algorithm to explore the new, new, uh, new solutions to improve the trade-off. So crossover, just like we randomly combine two solutions and uh, generate uh, two new solutions. Uh, the solution, solutions X1, X2 can survive in the current population. It means they have some good features. They find some layers, uh, they find some um, degrees, they work well, well for current uh, setup. So if we change their solutions, we may have a chance to get better solution. And the mutation is uh, simply we randomly increase and, uh, or decrease the uh, degree of different um, polynomials. It have, it, um, we can ex it's locally explore to better solution. Because this is a two objective optimization problem, so we we use a uh, long dominated sorting to combine different uh, solutions in terms of two objectives. So crowding distance means that sometimes the solutions they may cluster in somewhere. So we want the we want this uh, solutions they uniformly distribute the over a trade-off. In that case, we can better explore the whole search space. This is this is called one generation. We repeat the pro iteration many times until we the search is converged or we reach out our search budget. Finally, after we plug in the polynomials back, uh, plug in the polynomials into the convolution neural networks, uh, there is a, a accuracy drop to recover the accuracy. We need to fine tune the polynomial, so we propose neural network adaptation. It means our polynomial networks inherit the trailable weights, like the convolutional weights, batch normal weights, and then we just uh, inherit the weights. This is our finding tuning objective. So the, fir the first objective is uh, cross entropy loss, and the second objective is uh, KR divergence loss. KR divergence loss, we just uh, push the ReLU uh, output and the polynomial net uh, output uh, close to each other. In that case, the polynomial networks can inherit the uh, representation learning ability from the ReLU network because we know the ReLU network has better representation learning ability compared to the polynomial network. And uh, we used the, the pre-trained ReLU networks, so we save the training, or we have better training efficiency. We just adapt trailable weights to the polynomials. Then we do experiments over the encrypted CIFAR-10 CIFAR dataset und under FHE. This is a CIFAR-10 dataset, and uh, we do experiments on Amazon AWS. This is a baseline. MPCN is a high-degree polynomial op approximation, and uh, ASPA is a low-degree polynomial. And, uh, we, and uh, we also benchmark different uh, uh, homomorphic incubation schemes. We compare the CKKS and the TFHE. We know the TFHE can directly uh, evaluate the nonlinear activation function, and the uh, TFHE is uh, bootstrapping is very fast. But however, when we evaluate a convolutional neural, neural network, if we use TFHE, we have to evaluate millions to billions gates. So in total, the, the TFHE the uh, latency is very high compared to the CKKS. And uh, this is our result, auto FHE. We, has, we, have, we, have, we have better uh, trade-off compared to uh, baselines. So this is a uh, multiplicative depth of different uh, architectures. We, try, uh, we do the different uh, convolutional neural architecture, uh, like uh, VGG and uh, ResNet, uh, different numbers of ResNet. And uh, this is a distribution. 
So this example of VHG11, and uh, this is uh, there are different uh, uh, evil functions. We say the first uh, uh, first three layers, uh, the polynomial is very close to, to very very close to the ReLU function. It means may it means it want to make the visual features keep very weird. And uh, during and the later uh, f polynomial functions, they are just uh, square f uh, square functions. So we can save the uh, levels. So in that case, we can save the bootstrapping. So we can accelerate the inference. So to conclude my uh, presentation, I we think we should directly optimize end-to-end -end polynomial architectures. We should. Uh, um, in we use multi-objective optimization. We can automatically generate uh, Pareto effective solutions to meet different uh, requirements. And uh, we jointly optimize the uh, evil ReLU and the uh, bootstrapping. We have the uh, optimal polynomial architectures. And uh, we use the uh, trailable weights from the ReLU networks, so the weights can adapt it to the uh, polynomials. So if you want to read our papers and uh, get the online slides, you can scan this qu QR code. Thank you. Uh, OK, I, I, I had a question. So you're, you compared TFHE to CKKS. Yes. And you said that TFHE had all, uh, a higher latency against yes. the But that's cheating, because it's amortized latency. So what happens if you just look at latency, latency for one image? Uh, no, no, no. This is because uh, TFHE, when we evaluate the TFHE and the CKKS, we make sure the, they use the same number of threads. Yeah, yeah, but you, you, you gave an amortized latency, but mm. in practice that's cheating. Because if I'm evaluating a network, I only care about one image, I don't care about thousands. So what happens to your CKKS thing if you only evaluate one image? And you don't look at amortized latency. Oh, if uh, uh, in here we evaluated the 96 image. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but if you only evaluated one, mm. what would be the latency then? Uh, just uh, uh, the latency, uh, just the times 90, uh, 96. So, times 96. So, so, yeah, so, what does it come to? Does it come more or less than TFHE? No, no, no. Their position is is same because. Because when we evaluate the CKKS, we use line, uh, 96 threads. Yeah. When we evaluate the TFHE, we also use uh, 96 threads. So they use the uh, same. Oh, I see you're talking about threads. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. We keep ah, their okay, th yeah. threads same. So if we change it back to the latency, the position is same. Still think it's a bit of a cheat, but OK. Um. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So how long do the fine tuning take? <coughs> oh, fine tuning is yeah. very fast. We just fine tuning it for five five epochs. Oh, at the back there. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So you said you use evolutionary algorithms to optimize the the uh, the polynomial optimization or something. So each time you have to fine tune the model and infer on the whole data set to have like a fitness value for the accuracy, I guess. Oh, uh, sorry. So each time when you do the optimization process using the evolutionary algorithm, yes, you have to infer the model on the whole data set, right? Uh, to measure the accuracy. Oh, no, no, no. We just uh, sample a subset to estimate it. All right. And so how, how long does it take in practice like to converge and... Uh, OK, so for one architecture, it may take uh, one day. All right, that's nice. And so uh, is the callback labeler part in the loss necessary to optimize the model, or can you do without it? Sorry? You, you showed the loss with the callback labeler uh, part. Mm. Is this necessary to fine tune the model, or can you do without it? Uh, w we, can, we can do both. Uh, not not fine tuning and uh, fine tuning, but we say the fine tuning can improve the uh, accuracy a little. Uh, oh, one more there. Hold on. Last question. Oh, hello. Very quick one. Mm -hmm. um, in which encoding domain are the convolution done? Uh, sorry. So how how do you perform the convolution? Is it um, 
le linear transformation or do you switch uh, to the coefficient domain? You mean the, so you mean the implementation of uh, convolution? Yes. Uh. Oh, we use the uh, implementation of uh, MPCN. We ah, use the okay. same operation. Okay, thank you. Okay, we thank the speaker again because we're kind of running a bit, a bit late. <laughs>